Hey, what is up guys? This is Nishi from MST.TV here back with another Market Watch episode. Today we're going over a few different cards that have started to pop up within the format. It's really easy to just look at Fire King Snake Eye because it's a tier zero deck and just think that everything revolves around that, but Phantom Nightmare actually brings us a lot of solid support for other strategies as well. And of course, with that we do see different cards being bought out, either because they're being used to help those strategies out or because they enable those strategies to fight better against what is looking like a tier zero deck this format. And so we're going to go over several of the different price spikes that we've seen within the last week or so. Let's get started. All right, so the first card we're looking at is Relinquished Anima. This is something we talked about a month or two ago, but it's really been seeing a lot of play over the last few weeks as players have prepared for Phantom Nightmare. Anima is a simple Link 1 monster that requires a level 1 monster to make. All it does is equip itself with a monster that it points to. Now essentially this card punishes your opponent for placing their monsters into the incorrect zones, since absorbing something like a Kirin and then getting it into the graveyard without destroying it can really mess with your opponent's plans. It's also worth noting that it's an extra deck monster that can help to ensure your SP Little Knight gets its additional banish effect, and of course, with all of the level 1 monsters being used by Snake Eye strategies, bringing this card out is actually pretty easy. The card has two different printings, it was originally an ultra but then it came out as a secret rare reprint in Brothers of Legend. After that the card was sitting at around $2-$3 to $3 for quite a while. Within the last 3 months though we've seen both printings of the card continue to trend up. The card has been talked about ever since the Snake Eye cards first became popular in the OCG, but with the Fire King Snake Eye extra deck being really tight, there may have been a bit of hesitation with this card and whether or not it was actually worth an extra deck spot. However, it seems that a lot of players have picked up on the card, and we now see either version of the card sitting around that $5-$6 to $6 range. For now, I do actually see the card come up quite often, but at the same time I feel like the more that people are prepared for it, the less effective it is, but still it can force your opponent to make some slightly different plays, and you definitely want to be able to punish your opponent for not playing correctly. I don't think that this card's price is really going to go anywhere anytime soon. I expect it to stay pretty steady at around $5 until it either drops out of the format or gets another reprint. Okay, so this is a pretty interesting card, it's Crossout Designator. I feel like we've talked about this card across at least 10 different market watches in the past, but we're actually starting to see this card being used more and more. It's a pretty simple card, essentially you're using it to play through hand traps, where if your opponent say Nibiru's you, you chain this card, banish a Nibiru from your deck, and then the Nibiru is negated, allowing you to resume your play uninterrupted. There's a lot of players on really hand trap heavy builds of Snake Eye Fire King this format, and Crossout is a versatile answer to a lot of these cards, as it hits things like Ash, Nibiru, Droll, and Infinite Impermanence. In fact, it's so popular that some players are even jumping on Cyphering Gear Delta as a way to negate Crossout Designator and ensure that the combos are stopped. As far as printings go, Crossout has two different versions, which actually came out in back-to-back -back tins. It was first an Ultra in 2021, and then it got a secret reprint in 2022. The card has always had a ton of potential, so despite it not seeing much play early on, after that secret reprint, we saw both versions of the card stay pretty steady at around $8-$10. to $10. I'm pretty sure it's been there ever since those tins dropped in 2022. However, within the last couple of months, the card has been talked about more and more, and we're now seeing the card creep up to around $13-$15. to $15. Overall, I do think that Crossout Designator is a really good card this format. I think it'll definitely see a lot of play, and it's going to be really useful going first, since even if you don't use it to stop your opponent from hand trapping you, you could still stop key engine cards in the mirror match. The only thing we do have to worry about is the card getting a reprint in Rarity Collection 2, which actually seems extremely likely given the wide range of cards that we're expecting to be reprinted. You might want to just hold on to a set of this card for yourself to play with, but offload the others just in case that reprint does hit. That fear of a reprint is definitely going to work to prevent this card from going much higher in terms of price over the next couple of months. So this one's definitely one of the weirder ones on this list, we're just going to talk about it briefly. This card is Nephthys the Sacred Flame, so honestly I completely forgot about it, but the Nephthys archetype actually got several support cards back in Hidden Summoners. They became a ritual theme, they got a bunch of different sort of like niche support cards. They were never even slightly meta relevant though, so don't feel too bad if you forgot about them. Now Nephthys is supposedly an extra deck option that you can use in the voiceless voice strategy. It's a Link 3 that requires two or more monsters to make, where at least one is a ritual monster, but it gains effects depending on how many ritual monsters you use to Link Summon it, and the effects do stack. So if you use one, it can't be destroyed by battle, two, it can't be destroyed by card effects, and it goes up to 3600 attack points, 
and three, it can't be targeted and goes up to 4,800. So this card does have the potential to become like this giant towers-esque monster, which I guess is cool to have available as an option for a strategy that doesn't really go into its extra deck. This card has never been meta relevant before, but because it's so under the radar and was a secret rare from a side set without a reprint, we were seeing it sit at around $2. Now within the last couple of months, it has climbed up pretty steadily to around the $5 to $6 mark, and of course it's sort of been under the radar, so I don't see any reprint for this card coming anytime soon. However, this card is most likely not worth playing. Like, I get that it's an interesting possible tech, but the chances of it coming up are just so unlikely that I really wouldn't bother. Rather than trying to use it, this is the sort of card that I would try and dig up out of your holo bulk and offload right away, that is if you can actually find someone who's willing to pay money for it. So here's a bit of a smaller card, it's Earth Golem at Ignister. Super Polymerization is a card that's been seeing more and more play over the last couple of months. It's one of the strongest board breakers in the game right now, getting rid of multiple of your opponent's monsters without giving them a chance to respond. Of course, it's something that players will actively try to play around, but there are some times or certain lines where it's just impossible to do so. Earth Golem is super useful as a super poly target, getting rid of a Cybers monster and a Link monster. Now in Snake Eye Fire Kings, I feel like the game states are very fluid and there's just so many different points of interaction, different combo lines depending on the way that you're playing, so you never see a specific end board like all the time. However, a very common one would be after your opponent uses Flamber's Dragon on your turn to push out IP Mascarena, and then you use Super Poly to fuse the IP away with an Amblo Whale or an Appaloosa, but there are other targets that you can use to disrupt mid combo, such as Heat Soul, Link Karibo, and Promethean Princess. Oddly enough, Earth Golem at Ignister only has one single rare printing from Ignition Assault, and it was never reprinted in the tins or anything. It was basically just a bulk card, but because the set came out a full four years ago, this card is somewhat difficult to find now. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen the card go from being a dollar or a dollar fifty to shooting up out of nowhere this past week and hitting the three to four dollar mark. With just the one printing, the card is actually quite difficult to find, however, I don't know how much play it'll actually see. Most people are primarily using Garura and Mud Dragon if they are running Super Poly, and your extra deck space is just so tight that Super Poly might not be the most efficient use of space. Either way, this is a card to make note of so that you can dig it up out of your bulk and offload it before it gets a hollow upgrade somewhere. Moving on, we next have a really random card called Royal Swamp Eel. This card is a level 4 fish tuner, where its only effect is that if it's used as a synchro material, all of your other materials need to be fish. It's definitely weird that a card with such limited applications would actually be in demand, but we have to remember that your pool of fish monsters isn't really all that big. However, Royal Swamp Eel actually fits in nicely with several other cards being used in the Goatee strategy, which got some new support cards in Phantom Nightmare. The card is searchable with Abyss Shark, and it also works with either Keef or White Sardine, both cards that are able to get level 2 non-tuners onto the board so that you can combine them with Royal Swamp Eel to make Arian posts. Royal Swamp Eel has just one printing as a super rare back from Crimson Crisis, a set that came out literally back in 2009. This is a card that has seen some hype every now and then, I think typically it's summoned off of Super Ancient Deep Sea King Coelacanth, and it's a relatively high level tuner that could make some interesting synchro plays. Historically, the card has sat at around $3 each, just because of its limited availability, but we're now seeing the card up to around $6 to $8 on TCG Player. Even though the card is theoretically useful, I don't think it's really worth playing. The card is just so restrictive with what you can go into, and even then, as much as Goaty or Goaty Runic is an interesting deck, I don't think it's going to be too meta relevant. The main reason that this card is so expensive as it is, is its lack of availability. And as soon as that reprint does drop, the card is going to tank in price. You may as well try and offload this card while its value is relatively high. Moving on, we next have Sephira, Queen of Dragons. So in Phantom Nightmare, after the Snake Eye cards, the Voiceless Voice are the next most hype strategy to come out of the set. It includes retrains of a couple of older ritual monsters, including Cerevis, Skull Guardian, and Sephira. The deck does run the old Cerevis, but recently we've actually seen Sephira start to get a bit of attention in the deck as a one of. This card is kind of underwhelming since it doesn't really do anything on the board during your turn, it's just during the end phase that you have the option to rip a card from your opponent's hand instead. If you have the resources available to you, this makes it a pretty decent tech card if you're choosing to go first. 
Tafira used to have just two printings. It was an ultra rare and an ulti in Duelist Alliance, and then it got an ultra rare reprint in the tins later on. The ultis have actually been quite expensive for a little while, ever since it was first revealed that the theme would be getting redone, but the ultras have quietly gone up over the last month or so to where either ultra rare printing is now just under the $10 mark. However, the sad news that just got confirmed a couple of days ago is that Sephira is getting either a common or super rare reprint in OTS Tournament Pack 24, and that's definitely going to hurt the value of those more budget ultra rare printings. I think that in general the ulti should be safe, since it's the max rarity version of the card and honestly it does look really amazing, but we should expect the ultras to fall in price over the next couple of weeks as players get access to OTS 24. And finally, one last card for us to look at today is Light and Darkness Dragon. So this is a really old card that seems to be sort of random to talk about. It's a level 8 dragon that can't be special summoned, but when you or your opponent activates a spell card, trap card, or monster effect, you have to negate the card and destroy it, and then this card loses 500 attack and defense. Also, if this card is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, you destroy all cards you control and revive a monster from there as well. So this card was used years ago in some Frog Monarch decks as sort of a boss monster that you could just sit on and negate all of your opponent's cards with. It really slowed the game down since it's mandatory to negate everything, but it would also negate your things too if you did activate something, so you kind of just had to sit on it. The reason we're bringing this card up is that it started to see play in some sort of like Rogue Horus deck where you tribute summon this over your Horus monsters and just control the game from there. But the fact that this card is also used in Edison format as well is another factor contributing to the card's popularity. With this card there are a few different printings, of course there's the Retro Pack 2 Secret Rares, we won't worry about those because they're ridiculously high. The printings I'm showing you guys the graphs for here are for the Ultra and Super. The Ultra was a manga promo while the Super Rare was a special edition promo. At the moment, the Ultras are actually up at around $15 to $20, while we have both the Commons and Supers at around $3 to $4 each, with both versions having surged in value over the last month or so. We do also have the original Manga Secrets at around $50 to $70 each, though there are limited sales up at that high of a price point. With this card, I think it's interesting. I don't think it's going to see real meta play in 2024, right? But as far as past format support goes, I think that's where this card is really going to come through, as it was quite an iconic card back around like 2008 to 2010. Dig up your cheaper printings out of your bulk if you happen to find them, and make sure that these are in your binder if you have any Time Wizard events in your area. Alright guys, that is it for today's episode. Definitely some weird cards that have started to pop up here and there, uh, but I am excited for OTS Tournament Pack 24. I'm really excited because that Ultimate Rare Harpy's Feather Duster does look really, really nice. Make sure that you guys check it out. Hopefully I'm able to get the textured version and not a flat version like we've seen with some of the Ultimate Rares in recent OTS Tournament Packs. Anyways guys, if you did enjoy today's Market Watch episode, please make sure you let me know by hitting that thumbs up button. Make sure you leave a comment in the comment section down below and hit subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, guys, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV.